Okay. I can't see my video. <laughs> awesome. Everything broke. Hang on one second. <laughs> okay, hold on one second while I do a quick refresh. It's working. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's incredibly buggy learning space. <laughs> I'm your host. Uh, wait, I have a name. Dr. Nicole Gallucci. I am the postdoc with the Cosmo Quest Project. Uh, we are back from Dragon Con. Uh, the Cosmo Quest team, the bulk of the Cosmo Quest team, was just in Atlanta, Georgia, for biggest fan run sci fi and fantasy convention probably in the world. Probably in our corner of the Milky Way. Um, I'm still a bit sick from the con crud, so I have cough drop, I have sniffles, so uh, bear with me. We've had a bit of tech problems, so thank you guys for your patience while we, uh, while I rebooted my computer and got everything started again. Um, reminder, as we do every week, please use the Q&A or question and answer app. If you're watching this on YouTube or Google Plus, it should show you right about there, little yellow bar. This is join the conversation. Um, comments on the <coughs> uh, hello L G E. I don't know how to pronounce your first name, so correct me in there. Uh, welcome, and I'm glad you enjoyed our terrible, terrible pun on Twitter. Uh, so Helga <laughs> says Q and A is open. What about the bar? Uh, it, it's still early afternoon here in the U.S., so, uh, yeah, we won't be doing any of that, <laughs> but I am having lunch. Uh, <clears throat> good evening to Guido in Germany. Hi, Alt, Douglas. Hello to Nancy in New Jersey. Um, I'm starting to feel better, so thanks for that. And hello to Hugo, who I realize is on his way to the pharmacy and rushing home to make it in time for the show to start. So, uh, we started a little, our tech problems were just for you. We started late just for you. I have with me our guest, Andrea Jones from the NASA Goddard Space Planner. Hello, Andrea. Hello. Hi, and welcome. And we, uh, we're going to talk today about International Observe the Moon Night. It is uh, a big celebration that's happening. When is it happening? It is happening soon. It is coming up on Saturday, this Saturday, September 6th. So. That's right. If it happens every year, and this year it's September 6th. Awesome. So September 6th, uh, the website that we'll be talking about, I'll share the link on the event pages. It's observethemoonnight.org. Pretty easy. Observethemoonnight.org. I'll put that on the event page so you guys can uh, follow along with that. So, Andrea, tell us a little bit about what is this event? What is this celebration? Sure. So International Observer Moon Night is a celebration of the moon and lunar science and exploration. Um, it is a time when we encourage people from all over the world to go out and look at the moon and maybe learn a little bit about it. That's even more fun. Um, but we really are trying to get people just to get excited about lunar science and exploration. Um, and you do this by hosting or attending events. So these can be large or small. Uh, my parents have an event every year on their porch. Um, they invite their neighbors over. The cat comes out. You know, they all get excited. They don't have a telescope. Um, they should, but they don't. And and they just go out. And there are also museums, science centers, um, schools, clubs, um, astronomy clubs, and also Girl Scouts and, and other organizations that just host events of a variety of sizes and they just get people together and if they have one they get together with a, an astronomy club if they have one they grab some binoculars maybe a moon map um, and they go out and they look at the moon and maybe try to figure out what some features are um, and we have a number of different things for hosts on our website observe the uh, that can help people host events if they are interested in it but really, it's just trying to get people to learn about the moon, learn about Earth's nearest neighbor, and get excited about space and, and science and exploration of the solar system. 
yeah, so here's the website. Um, <clears throat> see, you have event locations, and, and pretty much uh, all over North and South America, a couple places in Africa, all over Europe, there's just this ridiculous density of red and blue dots. So these are all events that are happening. Yes, and, and we do know that there are actually other events that are not uh, showing up on that map. For example, in Africa, we have some partners that have let us know about events that people can't register because they don't have access to internet. So that is a minimum number of events, um, but it is kind of exciting to see that map fill up. So if you are hosting an event, uh, please do register it and, and add, add to the map and, and see where everyone else around the world will be celebrating with you. So how can somebody uh, begin to host or register an event? Sure. So on, on this website, it has all kinds of information. And one of the things that you can do is where it has that big map, you can explore where there are things. But there's a tab on the top that says Get Involved. Mm -hmm. And right up there, the first thing on that tab is Register an Event. And so you can click on that tab and you can then uh, drag a yellow marker to your event location or um, otherwise enter in your information. Um, and what that does is we keep a list of all of the event hosts, and then we try to send you information that will help you host your event. So on the website, there are things like um, event materials. So you can have, you know, um, if advertising materials that we have already made for you that you can take advantage of. There are flyers, there are moon maps, there are save the date cards, things to get ready ahead of time. Um, then we have things like a moon map. Um, we make a map every year of the phase of the moon, uh, the phase that the moon will be in on the day of International Observe the Moon Night. It is called that, but of course the moon is out during the day just as much as at night. Um, so you can see it any time, and you can look for features. We highlight some every year. Um, and also on the event materials, we have you know, some guides for hosts that are or in, under Get Involved, sorry, um, about how to host an event. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of goes through and says, hey, here, consider you know, your audience and your setting. How, how are you going to have this event? Where is it going to be? What kinds of things should you be thinking about? Who can help you? Um, maybe you can get in touch with a local astronomy club, but maybe you can call on a solar system ambassador. Um, maybe you need some help with some materials. And so all of that is on the website. And I do also have to say we have evaluation forms on the website. So um, our main uh, source of information about this event is our website. And we are trying to populate it and keep it updated and, and have all kinds of useful things for you, such as links to activities that we're highlighting each year. So hands-on activities that you can do with your audiences um, and those moon maps, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes we have contests, like an art contest. Um, and we also have places people can share information, um, places where you can share social media, uh, get involved, and have you know, our Twitter and, and Facebook accounts and things like that. But we do want to find out what else we can do for you. And that is available through the evaluation site. So we have evaluations for hosts and for participants. So participant um, surveys are iPad friendly, or you can use them on the computer, or you can download them and print them and you know, mail them to our evaluator. But really, online is, is much easier. Um, and then same with facilitator or host surveys. And then we can find out what you need from us so that we can make this even better next year. Cool. Thank you for pointing out the evaluations. I don't think we've used that in previous years in our local one, but we'll definitely use that. Uh, that would be fantastic. We would appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, uh, what about you finding out what we can do, it also is helping us find out why people come to these events mm -hmm. and what they get out of them. Because we have a lot of outreach events all over the world, and, and NASA certainly sponsors a lot of them. And we really want to know why people come and, and what what effect it has, what impact these events have. And so we're trying to help find that out. <laughs> so uh, what kind of numbers do you have? Like what are the typical number of events, number of people that you reach overall or per event in past years? Great. So um, we typically have between five and 600 events all over the world um, in over 50 countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have had, um, between 2010 and 2013, we had about 
750,000 people wow. attend um, one of over 2,000 events held in 81 countries total. Um, and so that is based on um, the numbers that our, our surveys have, so in terms of average attendance at different events. Um, and again, they range from, you know, three people in their backyard to several thousand people. Um, but that's, that's our estimate. What are some of the bigger events like? What uh, sorry, location? What, what are some of the bigger locations like, the big hundred to thousand people events? Um, well, we have several big ones at NASA centers around the country. Um, we also have some museums that make this into a really big gala event, and they have all kinds of things. We have also had some weddings, where lots of people what? at weddings a wedding? look at the <laughs> weekend together. I will mention that perhaps there have been you know, colleagues of mine in attendance at some of these weddings, but we have heard of others. Uh, military Wait a second, I think I was at one of them. I think I was at one of them. Oh, good. I think that was good. a new one year. That. I think oh. I was at a wedding, I think it was like three years ago? Oh my god, oh, it was 2010. It was at a wedding, and I made everybody go outside, and I pointed at the moon. Yeah, I think I was one of those. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. Yeah, we've had some big ones, you know, at military bases, um, at universities. Um, around the world, there's, um, there, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter hosts uh, workshops for teachers every summer, and we had some teachers from South America come, and they brought International Observer Moon Night back to Bolivia, and they had a huge event there. So, so those are some of the big ones. Cool. Um, how can somebody find an event near them? What's, what's your best method? Ah, a great question. So you go back to the website, and in the Get Involved tab, the third tab mm -hmm. over, it has register an event on top, and then the second one is attend an event. So whenever you register an event, attend you an event. have okay. a choice of making it public or having it be private. So if you want to have a Girl Scout group, for example, get together and you want to say, hey, we're part of this bigger celebration that's taking place around the world and you want to be a part of that, you can register it but not leave any information about where it's going to be held or things like that so nobody right. else will be able to show up. Or you can say, hey, everybody, come on, join us. Let's all have a great big party and learn about the moon. Then you can make it public and show where it will be, and then people can come to your event. Uh, so we have a comment from our friend Guido. Uh, he says, there's only one event in Germany. It's in Berlin, far away from me. But I'm checking the weather report. Yes, it figures it's supposed to rain here this weekend. So do you have any advice for people who are interested but don't have an event near? And then secondly, do you have any advice for people who are going to have bad weather in the forecast? Well, it is always disappointing if you are going to have bad weather on a, a moon night. Um, I would say there are a few options. Uh, first one being, you know, you can have a rain date and, and do it another time. You can still, you know, register and get all the materials for hosts and all of that and just you know, delay celebration a little bit. Or um, there are lots of things like um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website for their camera has all kinds of amazingly beautiful pictures. So if you're having an event, you can post pictures of the room or of the moon around, you know, your event room. Or LRO also just recently had a moon as art contest. Mm. And on that... Um, on our website, you can also get pictures of the moon that are really beautiful from, that are not just pictures, but they're data sets and other images um, that you can post around the room. And that way, people can still look at the moon and talk about the moon. And, you know, there's even on, again, LRO website, on the LROC, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera website, there's a place that you can explore and zoom in on to the highest resolution um, images of the moon available. They're so good that if you lay down on the moon and you made a moon angel, this camera could see you. Cool. And so you can explore the moon in that detail. So you can still observe the moon even if it's not through a telescope. Right. So, yeah, it depends on, on, on the venue. Um, if you're purely outdoors, you don't want to be out if it's raining, I guess. Um, but even if it's cloudy, uh, you can still do that. Um, I can recommend, uh, so CosmoQuest, we host moon mappers, which 
is a citizen science project that uses the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter images so you can get on your computer and, and, and do some moon mapping with us on CosmoQuest. Absolutely, well. I should have mentioned that too. We would we would be delighted to have you do that as well. Uh, and then, uh, so ours isn't officially on the calendar yet here in Edwardsville, as I told you. I told you, Andrea. Uh, we do one at the custard stand in town. Uh, Annie's custard in Edwardsville. Yay! Props to them. They let us bring uh, us and the uh, Smokewest Center at SIUE and um, the uh, Riverbend uh, Astronomical Society. Uh, we all come out, uh, or Astronomical Club, I don't actually remember, Riverbend. Um, we all come out, bring our telescopes and look at the moon, uh, but we also bring, um, especially the folks from Riverbend, they have lots of kits of astronomy outreach from the Night Sky Network, and so we do lots of hands-on astronomy. So our event starts before sundown, so we can like do things in the when it's still light out, and then when the moon, you know, we can point at the moon as it gets dark, and if not, we can just keep going. Things, so that's terrific. Yeah, we certainly encourage people to partner um, and and bring all different talents together. If you have that available, that's just fantastic. Sure. And if not, you know, you do the best you can with what you've got, and and that's why we have those resources on the website, so anyone anywhere can find information that they might want. Um, but yeah, if you have local talent. This is a great opportunity to bring the community together. What kind of activities um, would you recommend? I mean, looking at the moon is, is, is the best one, but what kind of other activities do you recommend? Yeah, um, we, have, we have links to several ones, but I can just maybe describe a few in case you'd like to know what we're doing. So at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center here in Greenbelt, Maryland, we are going to be having an event at our visitor center. And we are expecting um, between five and six hundred people or so, maybe five and seven hundred, depending on how nice the weather is. Um, yeah. And one of the very popular activities we're expecting, anyway, is an Oreo phases activity. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you know about this. Because please, please describe that. I love it, but please describe it for our audience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Next time you are eating Oreos, I hope you all do this, and you can unscrew the Oreo cookie and lay it out, and if you unscrew it and get the icing all on one side, you have just created two phases of the moon. You have a new moon with no icing on it, and a full moon with all of the icing on it. Now you can do this for all of the cookies in the package, or at least, you know, four, um, and then you can use a spoon or a knife to carve out some of the icing from each side and you can make things like uh, crescent moons and gibbous moons and quarter moons and, and third quarter moons and then you can arrange them in order and on the Lunar and Planetary Institute website um, there is a, a whole section called Explore and it's for informal science educators and in there, it has Marvel Moon, which has a whole bunch of different activities. But one of them is the Oreo phases. And they have a placement on their website. And you can print it out and then arrange the phases on there with your cookies. And then you get to eat the phases. Um, and we highly recommend that you know you do eat them, but you also maybe talk about, hey, what's happening? And how are they, how are they different each time of the month? How long does it take to have the phases? What are the phases' names? Um, and, you know, how long does that take? You might print out a lunar observation journal and encourage people to go home and start uh, making observations every day throughout the month to see what happens to the moon. When does it rise? When does it set? What does it look like? Where is it getting bright? Where is it getting dim? Um, and so keep that learning going throughout, throughout the next month or so. Um, there's lots of great activities. Well, um, one year we did impact paintings where we dropped um, cotton balls that are covered in paint from like three different colors of paint. We started with you know red and then went to yellow and then went to blue and we dropped them on targets and then you could see which craters are the oldest and which ones are the youngest based on you know what colors of paint you could see. That's another really fun one. I like that. Yeah, that one did a lot. We have, you know, um, we're doing a balloon astronauts one this time, and we're talking about how lunar explorers have to deal with the dust environment on the moon and the charged environment, um, how it, it actually gets, you know, dust particles to stick to astronaut suits and their boots, and it got, you know, in their, their lungs, and it was a real problem. So we have balloons, and we blow them up, and we have people rub them on their hair, and then hold them over 
um, some salt that we've spread on the table. And you can, you know, with that static charging, as long as it's not too humid, the salt will jump up onto the balloon. And that's, you know, like the dust being attracted to the astronauts. And on the balloons, we have, you know, the kids draw their astronauts and draw their explorers, and then they get to, you know, have, have them get all dusty with the salt. So that's another one. There's so many great ones out there. I encourage you to, you know, ask me if you'd like more suggestions, but then just do some exploring on the LPI site, maybe on, through CosmoQuest, through, you know, the International Observer Moon Night website. There are so many great things out there. I will also mention just one other resource, NASA Wavelength. Mm. If you are not familiar with it, it is a collection of every um, product that has gone through NASA Education product review and also some links to visualizations and other things. And anything related to the moon in there um, would be great too, especially if you search maybe informal audiences or outreach or you know the age of the, the people that you're expecting. Um, NASA Wavelength would be another great place to find some activities to do. Yeah, this is by far one of my favorite resources uh, is NASA Wavelength for finding it's <clears throat> finding by topic, finding by how much money I have to spend on an, on an activity, finding by age range. That's really great. It's a fantastic searchable database. So yes, do take advantage of that. I want to go through some of these comments. Um, uh, Guido at the beginning was looking out the window to see if you can see the moon yet, and no, it's not quite high enough to be seen over the houses. So we're uh, coming up on what phase of the moon? What phase of the moon do you, is is Inam? <laughs> usually scheduled for? Well, um, this year it's just two days before full moon, oh. which is when it's actually not a really great um, phase for observing the moon if you are an astronomer anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because we really like to have the terminator, which is the line between the light, the day side of the moon and the night side. Um, objects along that terminator are really cool to look at through a telescope. And if you have a full moon, there's not a whole lot of shadows going on that really make things stand out. Um, but the way we select a date for International Observe the Moon is um, sometime in the fall. So it's always in the fall, um, September or October. Um, and then we try to pick a phase of the moon that is friendly for observing. But if that's not really good for a weekend, we always have it on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we also try to have it a little bit farther into the school year so that teachers right. and their schools um, can get involved. This event happens to not fall into some of those categories. We actually selected this date because we wanted it to fall in um, the fiscal year of 2014 um, because last year, at least at Goddard, we were not able to host an event uh -huh. because it was in October um, and the government shut down so we weren't able to have an event. So that's why we moved it to September this year. Um, and next year, it will be on September 19th. So okay. Okay. Um, we're already getting ready for that. We're going to have some Save the Date cards available on our website before uh, this Saturday so that if you want to print them out and say, hey, come next year, um, you'll be able to do that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, we have a couple of other uh, fun comments. Uh, Michael Jobin makes a black hole joke by saying it's an event with no horizon. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> Guido uh, says, substitute virtual moon observing night is a good ca idea in case of bad weather. So that's your, your moon mappers, your, your LRO camera website. Um, yeah, I will also just mention yeah. that we are really uh, excited about the social media aspect of this, mm. how people get together and talk about their events from around the world. So on Twitter, we are at Observe the Moon, and we also use the hashtag Moon Night. One, uh, one more oh, moon night, um, and then on Facebook we're International Observe the Moon Night. And so, if it's cloudy or kind of crummy where you are, um, you can go online and find out. People post pictures from around the world of you know their events and what they're doing and what they're seeing. So we sometimes have telescopes set up around the world, and you can see what they're doing. So get online if you are not able to get outside, <laughs> or be like me and do both, and or do both. Yep. split. <laughs> do uh, do you know of any live streaming events this year? Any anyone that's live streaming telescope views or, or anything like that? I am not aware of live streams for this year. It is something that we have done in the past, mm -hmm. um, but there might be someone who will do it, and if they do, they'll probably tweet about it. 
Okay. Um, Sounds good. And, um, yes, oh, I was going to say something else, and I, I can't remember what that is. Um, so, never mind. I'll come back to that That's if fine. I can. Uh, the Virtual Star Party did a live one two years ago. Um, you guys, uh, feel free to hound Scott and Fraser. <laughs> Don't tell them I sent you. <laughs> Uh, I think there will be a Sunday night event for the virtual star party, so I'm not sure if they'll, uh, maybe they can have a late virtual Observe the Moon night. Uh, that would be fantastic. So. And yeah, around on, on our map, um, all of the the bubbles, I guess, the balloons, those are just regular events, um, but all the little T's are tweet-ups. So yeah, I saw like, that. That's really cute. Yeah. All the little T's. Okay, so... <laughs> So quite a lot of social media action out there around the world. Have some more on, uh, oh, what am I doing? Oh, uh, Michael Jobin, uh, on the Oreo moon phases, uh, Oreos must go by way of a Milky Way. Again, clever. Uh, Nancy, I'll mention that last year we were going to do the Oreo phases activity and our event was canceled, so my colleagues and I had to take it upon ourselves to finish off all 400 <laughs> of Oreos that we had purchased for our event. So, 400 trooper. times 8, I ate about a third of that many Oreos last fall. <laughs> you are a trooper. You are... I, this is, yeah. Things I do for, for international observing, it's a real personal sacrifice. Things you do for science. Uh, Nancy Gonzano is going to has her local astronomy club with the planetarium that has a show, and that's great because planetarium doesn't care about the weather. So you can yes. sounds like they'll have an event no matter what's going on. Um, we have more mm, Oreos. Oh, and and Nancy points out because uh, she actually helped me do the uh, moon phases Oreo demonstration at a convention last year. Uh, you can also use those Oreos to demonstrate plate tectonics. So you can get two science for one. Or Indeed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, awesome. Um, so They're yeah, so there'll be... A, they'll demonstrations too, so you can really do them for everything. <laughs> What's that? Can you say that again? I, you broke up. You can use them for comet demonstrations too. Oh, so. talk a little bit about that. Um, we, we just have at Goddard, this is not a very good one, but you know, you can make dry ice or liquid nitrogen ice cream, mm -hmm. but if you mix in the, um, the organic material, the uh, Oreo crumbled up into your comet, then you get, you know, a more accurate, and maybe add some chocolate sauce for some additional organic material. So, tasty ways to make comets. <laughs> tasty comet, yes, that's the edible version. Do not eat the ones made of dry ice and dirt, but I typically no. make. No. That would be terrible. So yes, there will. There sounds like there will be a virtual star party Sunday night, uh, so they can uh, they could do a late celebration for you guys. If you miss the moon on Saturday, join the VSP folks on Sunday night. I'm sure. I'm sure somebody will get the moon in there for you. You could kind of hammer them away. Um, so what other? Um, do you have any other uh, favorite resources or events that you want to share related to observe the moon night? Anything uh, particularly historical, maybe? You know, the moon has been, you know, uh, a touchstone for humanity for so long. Yeah, and and so I can maybe just say a little bit about how we got started. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2009, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and its sister spacecraft, LCROSS, mm. launched towards the moon, and um, our teams here at Goddard and at NASA Ames uh, where the PIs, the principal investigators for the, um, the missions are based, wanted to celebrate, hey, we launched successfully, we made it to the moon into orbit um, successfully. This is really exciting. So they had a big uh, celebration at Goddard and at Ames in California in 2009. And there was so much um, interest on the part of the public that uh, we thought, hey, you know, we don't have to just do this one time. Why don't we make this into an event? As you said, the moon is really um, sort of an inspiration and, and a, a way to sort of loop people in and rope them in and get them excited about not only the moon, but about the solar system and about space and about everything out there. And the moon is just sort of the most familiar object in our sky besides the sun. Um, and it's a real... People have a lot of personal connections to the moon. People have a lot of stories. It's really fun. Um, when I lead workshops, I always start out and ask, hey, 
you know, what is your favorite memory of the moon? And it's just so much fun to hear what people have to say. Everybody has a memory of the moon. Um, and so we thought, well, why don't we take advantage of this and not just do it once, let's do it every year. And so um, we started National Observe the Moon Night and then um, started talking to partners uh, at NASA. So we have lots of um, not only LRO and LCROSS, but then LADI uh, is another lunar mission and GRAIL. Uh, is another mission out at the moon, and Artemis, and we have all these other missions, and then we have, you know, lunar scientists and engineers all over the place, and um, then we have partners like the Night Sky Network, and the CosmoQuest, and the Google Lunar X Prize, and all of these other groups got really excited and said, hey, we want to join the party too, let's, let's get everybody excited about um, the moon, and so it grew in 2010 to International Observe the Moon Night. Um, and, and every year we're just trying to figure out how do we get more people excited about the moon, how do we get them to learn more, and, and it is really an inspirational event. We just want people to get out and have fun and look up. Um, but, you know, if you can learn something too, that's even better. So we're trying to figure out ways to, to populate our website and to talk to people and to get stuff out on social media so people can not only have a really exciting time, but maybe start, you know, looking somewhere else. Um, we have visitor surveys that indicate that people really use this as a starting point and they come back to other events, they go look up information other places when they go home. Um, so I think anyone out there who hosts an event should think of it as a starting point, not an ending point. Cool. What is your favorite memory of observing the moon? Oh, my favorite memory, um, I have so many, but I, I will pick one. I used to work at an outdoor science school in California, in the mountains of California, and I worked with kids from inner city LA. So these kids had never been in, to the mountains before. Some of them had never seen trees before, which was remarkable to me. Um, I had a kid come up and say that he couldn't breathe up on the mountains because it was too clean. The air was too clean and he didn't, he didn't know how to handle that. I know um, that feeling. Yeah, yeah, and these are kids that all lessons stopped when the squirrels came out because they had never seen a squirrel before, and they all had to take pictures of it, and it was just, it was great. But um, I was the uh, astronomy instructor up there and the telescope operator uh, for our tiny little dinky telescope, and I would, you know, get it out and show them the moon, and they just could not believe what they saw. They just were fascinated that you could see craters and mountains and all these different things, even through our tiny little telescope. And they thought it was fake and they, they just couldn't believe it. And they couldn't believe that people had been to the moon and that it took them, you know, all this time to get there, even though they think it's so close. And it's just, it was so much fun to share lunar science with these kids that had never seen a telescope before and had never been exposed to lunar science of any kind. That, that's excellent. That was that's really cool. Yeah, the, the moon was the first um, astronomical object I looked at with a telescope. I was five, had a little Tasco, little red Tasco, little short tripod legs. Um, I grew up in, in uh, Staten Island, New York City, so there wasn't much else to see. We looked at the moon, put it on the way to the car. And I was like, oh my god, it looks bigger. There's like stuff and shadows and things. I was five, I didn't know any better. Um, but that was one of the things that hooked me onto science early on. Um, and the first time I looked through uh, like a proper observatory telescope at a local university, uh, it just blew me away that it looks like, like there's a landmass with mountains and things. So that's it. Really, is an experience um, for uh, for people. Um, yeah, I like that you mentioned that you could see it from Staten Island. Um, yeah. Just, I mean, given how much light pollution some places have. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an object, the moon, that you can see from anywhere. Right. So if you can get out to a dark sky area, that's even better. Um, but if you can't, you can still see the moon. We, I do not know of any place that is so light polluted that the moon is not visible. That would be, that would be really sad. So let's yeah. never get there. That would be like clouds, <laughs> constant cloud covers, so maybe parts of the UK. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It's true. Okay, uh, Nancy Graziano shares her favorite moon observation memories or watching the moon landings live. Thank you, Nancy, for once again making me jealous of the fact 
<laughs> I did not see the Apollo moon landing. Yes, so uh, for a lot of people, that really is the seminal moment, is watching, watching humans uh, bounce around on the surface. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see that, those of us who didn't see it the first time around. Uh, that would be wonderful. And, and this is a time, you know, for at your, or at your events to have these kind of conversations, you know, talk to people. What was your favorite memory? Tell me something about the moon. Why do you, why do you like it? Why are you interested? Um, when people come to the events, they tend to report that, you know, the best part is that inspirational part, seeing the moon and, and experiencing something, sharing something with their family. They do also enjoy learning about the moon, so if you can have that in there too, but really the affective part of the event is the real draw. And so, especially with the moon, with all these personal connections, with all these cultural connections, I think it's a, a great time to have a conversation. Um, another uh, uh, activity to mention, we have um, an activity called Moon Mythbusters that's mm -hmm. also available through Marvel Moon on the Lunar and Planetary Institute website. And it has all of these little factoids or non-factoids about the moon that says, you know, more babies are born at the full moon than any other time. And you have to decide, is this true or is this not true? And, um, and then you can assemble maps of the moon. And what you end up with is a true blue, all true near side and a far out, totally false far side. And then you can talk about those different things and, and talk to people, maybe not about misconceptions by that name. Most people right. don't want to hear that they have misconceptions. But you can talk about, hey, what is your understanding of the moon and maybe what, what might seem to be true but is not really true. And, and that's kind of a fun activity to do. Cool. Uh, and, and I would suggest uh, if you are stuck inside, if it's raining and cloudy, there's always that Mythbusters, that actual that Discovery Mythbusters episode about the moon landings and whether or not they were faked. And that is pretty enjoyable. Because yes. uh, the Mythbusters actually teamed up with NASA to test some things in a vacuum chamber uh, and, and recreate the photography and recreate the footsteps and recreate the flag planting. Uh, so that, that's enjoyable, too. Yes. And uh, I one of my... Still have yeah? to see it. I can't believe I have not seen it. I haven't um, seen it. It's quite I encourage cool. people to watch it all the time, and I have, like, no, no personal recommendation, but I hear such good things about it that maybe, maybe I will just have to go home Tonight, I don't know why find not. Seize yeah. the day. <laughs> That's right. Go home and find it. It uh, at the very end is is one of my favorite parts. They go to uh, the Apache Point Observatory, where uh, they have a laser that they use to shine uh, bounce back from the retro reflectors left by the Apollo astronauts. And so they were like, "Boom! There's equipment that we left on the moon. We're seeing the signal right now." Um, I never got to play with that laser, but I have been to that telescope. So that was pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, we have a laser ranging facility here at Goddard as well, yeah. and they. They uh, range to the, those um, objects as well on the moon, and also actually directly to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which Ooh. is remarkable to me, because that thing's cruising around the moon really fast, and they can actually hit a mirror on that spacecraft and, and determine its position within centimeters. It's remarkable. That's impressive. That's cool. Uh, Michael Jopin asks, Nick, have you counted all the craters on the moon yet? No. We have not. <laughs> so we are still, um, in fact, I, I recently reposted on CosmoQuest blog an old post of Stuart Robbins. Stuart Robbins is our Moon Mapper's uh, principal investigator. Um, Asky, we have, one of the biggest hits to our blog is the question, the go uh, question people type to Google, how many craters are on the moon? Um, and so Stuart Robbins goes through the kind of the numbers of how many craters there actually are on the moon in that blog post. Um, <laughs> And we are not done identifying all the craters in our data sets for moon mappers. So uh, <laughs> you can help us map, map craters and mark craters. We're not done. We're not done. Yeah, and there are more forming all the time. Uh, through, through LRO, we are finding more and more new impact craters. So throughout the mission, we have been able to actually say, hey, here's, here's one, here's another one, here's another one, here's a patch of them. Um, so, so we're never going to let you finish. I'm sorry. <laughs> The cosmic shooting gallery we live in will never let you be complete. That's, That's right. Sure. That's yeah, and, sure. and actually at our event at Goddard, we're going to have a whole table uh, dedicated to the moon online. So we'll have things like CosmoQuest, and we'll have things um, like, you know, the International Observer Moonlight page and Wavelength and, and all kinds of other resources 
for people to check out, of course, there's also the lunar portal. Um, so the moon portal that's available through um, NASA headquarters. So there are lots of different places where you can get information. And so, yeah, if it's rainy, get out your computer, count some craters, do some um, myth busting, and all kinds of other things. There's great stuff online about the moon. So uh, speaking of recent, recent changes to the moon with recent impacts, um, the moon, for a long time, uh, we, it, was, it was really thought to be this geologically dead, very boring place. We're learning in the last few years, because of all of these missions that are exploring it, that um, it's not such a dry, boring, dead place. Can you talk a little bit uh, about some of the things we've learned about the moon in the last few years? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think one of my personal favorites is that the coldest measured place in the entire solar system that we've ever measured, again, this is measured, um, is on the moon. Oh. A, a crater on the moon that is in permanent shadow. Okay. Um, is everyone familiar with permanently shadowed craters? Probably. Yeah. You going to give a brief brief definition? Sure. So let's see. Oh, I have no bowls. Oh, so no. I just... I, uh, I my... All right. So if you are to have, you Maybe. know, a moon. So here's, here's my moon. And if this is a crater on the moon then you can have craters facing on different sides. But if you have a crater at the pole of the moon, the moon is not tilted with respect to its axis as Earth is, or at least not much. It's only tilted a tiny bit. So if you have a crater that's on the pole of the moon, the sunlight that's coming shining in will never hit the bottom of that crater. It'll just go straight over the top. Because on Earth, as Earth spins around, you know, any impact craters if we were to have them stay on Earth, um, then the sunlight would eventually get into them. But not the, it's not so on the moon. And the moon has been um, the coldest measured place in the solar system because um, it has just these permanently shadowed areas. And it's the only place that has these. Every, every other object really tilts a lot more than, um, yeah, than the moon. So that's a really cool one. Uh, we've also found out that the moon is shrinking. Yeah. Anyone heard of that? I think that's really cool. Um, so we have found out that there are these scarps all around the moon. Um, and those scarps, they're, they're faults. They're places um, that there is evidence of shrinking, of crumpling. So if you were to make, you know, pudding and take it out of the oven and it contracts on the top, you get all these little cracks. And we have that same thing on the moon. So we have pudding cracks on the moon. <laughs> um, we also, you know, have all these, uh, I don't know. Something else I think is really cool is we've been finding out a lot of pits on the lunar surface. Yeah, so, those. Yeah, those are really neat. Um, we have, there are little holes, um, and we don't know if they're always just down or if they're actually tubes, um, like lava tubes that have um, been, you know, there's collapsed areas in the lava tubes like we have in Hawaii. Um, and those uh, are places that maybe we could send future explorers um, because they would have protection from the really, really harsh space environment. Um, so that's another cool one. I'll mention another one, and I can, I can mention more if you want, but something I think is really sure, cool. Sure, sure. Um, has everyone heard of Tycho? The crater Tycho on the moon? Oh, yeah, probably, because it's a very famous big crater with a rather large central peak. Exactly, and I don't know if you've seen it, but you should look up um, a picture of the Tycho central peak that LROC captured, so the LRO camera. And we, so the spacecraft normally points down at the moon, um, but for special operations, we can actually rotate the spacecraft and take pictures looking over the horizon, sort of like, what's up ahead, and we took a picture of Tycho Central Peak at um, when the sun was low on the horizon, and it's just gorgeous. It's like the Ansel Adams picture from the moon, and, and LROC has so many of these, but this is just a really remarkable one. But what I think is so cool... Is this the one? Yes, that one. Awesome. So, awesome. Do you see on top of that mountain, there is a little speck? Oops. Do you see the speck on the top of the mountain? That's it. Yep. Yeah. 
Anybody want to take a guess as to how big that speck is? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, and we'll probably have a bit of a delay on the comment. Um, I'll guess, the, I don't know if I'm biased because I probably know the resolution, but <laughs> 10 meters? No. It is the size of a baseball stadium. Oh my god! <laughs> wow! That the little boulder, what it looks like a little boulder, is the size of a baseball stadium. Wow. That's and we have awesome. no idea how it got there. Wow. That's really cool. There's our there's our baseball stadium. Right there. Yes. Right there. That is the size of a baseball stadium. None of our models for making impact craters permits a rock that big to be on top of a mountain in the middle of an impact crater. We just don't know how it's done. We don't have the physics in our models to permit that to happen. And yet there it is. I mean, it's just sitting like a little golf ball on a tee on top of this mountain. And so we have to be able to explain that. So we are learning all kinds of new things about impact craters and their formation and their dynamics because of some of these really cool images. Um, yeah, oh man, I could just go on and on. I mean, if you want me to, another, here, I'll do one more and then I'll stop. Sure, and then sure. Um, but another really cool thing, I think, is that we know the topography of the moon better than the Earth. Anyone have any idea how we are better aware of the shape of the moon than we are of the shape of the surface of the Earth? Um, the solid surface, anyway? Because it's smaller? <laughs> what do we have here on Earth a whole bunch of that we don't really have very much at all of on the moon? Mm, you going to go with water. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we have water. And we don't know the shape of the ocean floor Oh. Like, we know the shape of the surface of the moon. So we have a better idea of the topography of the shape of the surface of the moon than we do of the Earth. And I think that is just so cool. Wow. That is really cool. That is really cool. Uh, Nancy is looking forward to <clears throat> the first international observe the moon night in the not-too-distant future when there are actual observers on the moon. <laughs> now we, may, we may have to read name it intergalactic, interplanetary, something like that. Excellent. Well, you know, when we get there, Nancy, you can go ahead and, and suggest a name for us. I love it. I love it. Oh, no. Don't freeze. Oh, my computer scared me. Hey, um, trying to think if there was any last things that I... Oh, I wanted to ask one last thing. I noticed in 12, you had... A a winking for Neil on, on Moon Knight 2012. You want to tell us a little bit what that was about? Sure. So uh, Neil Armstrong passed away just a little bit before International Observe the Moon Knight last year, um, or in 2012. Mm -hmm. That was that was not last year. Okay. Two years ago. Well, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Remember the world end. Remember the world ended two years ago, according to the Mayan calendar. There we go. You got to remember. <laughs> yeah. So to honor him, and um, we decided to have people take pictures of themselves winking at the moon mm -hmm. and posting it on our website and then we actually shared those pictures with Neil Armstrong's family oh, to show funny. the support that um, people from around the world and, and not only the support but just how much he had affected people and how attached we all are to this man who, who did such remarkable things um, and, and we just wanted to, to be able to share that, have the community on Earth here uh, join together in honoring him and then share that with his family as well. That's fantastic. But that's what that campaign was all about. That's cool. Um, so we won't keep the move with Neil. Um, <clears throat> those of you who are fans of uh, the sitcom 30 Rock may remember Buzz Aldrin and Liz Lemon yelling at the moon. Uh, you could go ahead and do that as well. I don't know if you've seen that episode, that scene. No, I have not seen that, no. I don't remember the context. Uh, Buzz Aldrin was, was giving some advice to, to the character Liz Lemon, and uh, he said when he's having a bad day, he yells at the moon. Because, I walked on your face, moon. I, I, I don't remember the context. It's a very funny scene. I'm sure if you look at it, 
somewhere on YouTube or Netflix. It'll be there. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you can go with all different, all different um, approaches to this. Uh, we are celebrate main, how you choose. Yeah. Our our main uh, focus is celebrating the moon. Um, you can sort of choose to do that in a variety of ways, I suppose. <laughs> but really, awareness and and getting excitement out there and sharing it with a, a group of potential future lunar explorers yeah. is really, you know, what we're all about. And not just the explorers, but, you know, we'd love people to go into science and engineering as a result of these. But also, you know, if you can inspire a teacher or a politician or, you know, anybody, your neighbor, wouldn't it be nice to live in a society that knew more about the moon? So. Yeah. Um, that's something else. It's mostly just an awareness and a celebration, but but science too is certainly something that we're we're trying to get across. And if there's any way that we can help you do that, uh, please let us know. So so get out there, celebrate, host an event, go to an event, um, register it so that we can help you out and and let us know how it goes by filling out those evaluations and talk to people from around the world through social media. All of these ways are are just great ways to get involved. That's awesome. So that's observethemoonnight.org. Check out all the information there. Hashtag Moon Knight. Hashtag Moon Knight, right, for Twitter yep. and the social medias. So, yeah, keep in touch. And, and uh, like you said, this event really is for everybody all around the world. Uh, so you just want to get everybody, in, in, everybody involved, everybody to look up over the course of the weekend, even if you have to, if the weather's bad or use your computer. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for, for coming to talk about the International Observe the Moon Night with us here on Learning Space. Well, it was my pleasure, and I look forward to seeing the moon and, and hoping all of you do too this Saturday and, you know, the rest of the year as well. Awesome. We can do some quick announcements before we go. Uh, first of all, thank you all, Andrea and, and audience, for dealing with the tech issues this week. I have no idea what's going on uh, with my computer. I left it for a week, so it's very, it's very mad at me. Um, also, apologies for last week. I was out of town and Georgia was sick, uh, so we will be rescheduling uh, that Eyes on the Solar System broadcast with Rachel uh, Brockman Zimmerman from NASA. Uh, I think she's out on the other coast at JPL. I can't remember. I, I, I can never remember who's it got or who's at JPL. <laughs> all, all, all the awesome people. Um, so we'll be rescheduling that Eyes on the Solar System uh, learning space this Friday, September fifth. The return of the weekly space hangout. You heard it here first. I already poked at Fraser Kane. We're going to start off the Weekly Space Hangout this Friday afternoon because we promised it after Dragon Con. Uh, so, Guido, I know you're in charge of that uh, that scheduling uh, post over on the WSA crew community. Uh, it's it's um, officially bug us <laughs> because uh, Fraser said he'll do it. So we'll be starting the Weekly Space Hangout again this Friday. Um, and then Sunday night will be the this month's virtual star party. So check out the virtual star party page for that one. And I think that's it for announcements. I know Pamela Gay will be on travel once again. Start, she just got back from Dragon Con. <laughs> She's starting again. She's leaving again Saturday. So I don't know what the astronomy sc cast schedule is going to look like. But we'll, we promise to keep you updated. Um, we know Guido Bieber will keep you updated uh, in the community. And we'll let you know in the Cosmos newsletter. So that's all I have for announcements. Um, thank you again, Andrea. Everybody go look at the moon. Yay. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye.